The Small Man. Excerpted from The Art of Being Ruled. 1926. Wyndham Lewis. Narrated by Skeptical Waves. Chapter 1. The Two Great Rival Political Principles Today. Liberalist Democracy and Authority. A worldwide accommodation of ideas is going forward in which the European system is only one factor no longer possessing an ascendancy. Behind the scenes a novel adjustment of the world consciousness is in preparation. The democratic European idea is one that is undoubtedly being strangled off the stage. One day a messenger may appear and announce in solemn tones its pathos. By their superficial idea of freedom, by their insistence on the individual, any individual, that is, every northern or white community, from the Greeks to the present Europeans, have made it impossible for the white race to combine and consolidate itself. Each individual, when he got the chance, became a little universe to himself of exclusive personal life. The spectacular, in fact rather flashy, strength, but also the deep weakness of the white man has been his independence. Even his physical prowess is a weakness. His exclusive reliance on the physical has been made nonsense of by a physical thing, his greatest asset namely, science. The white man has not in his imagination been able to look all round the world and see it as one large mud ball with certain possibilities. Its possibilities of unification have escaped him, in spite of all his mechanical opportunities for becoming himself a unifier. He has only been able to propel his body laboriously round it, not his mind. So he made a better globetrotter and buccaneer than an organizer, or civilizer. Again, as good brains have been born in the West as in the East, no doubt, but they have been less used and exploited by the over-materialized Western rulers. Matthew Arnold's barbarian oligarchs, for instance, the English aristocracy, with their fine fresh appearance and fondness for outdoor sports, but who for thinking and reading have no great turn, were hardly the people to rule the world. So it is always important to remember what is currently meant in the West by freedom or independence. The Western democratic principle has always been too anarchic to be sensible. It sees things in pieces. It even sees life in pieces, its personality is unstable and easy to isolate. Such are some of the capital causes for the rapid eclipse of European power. Its character of independence, its pretended franchises, its nationalisms, make it unable to organize itself as one white race, and politically, organization is everything, talent, martial qualities, nothing. The parliamentary system is the great characteristic European institution that today has on all hands lost its meaning. There are no doubt worse things for the people than parliaments. But the humbug involved in such a transparently one-sided assembly makes it impossible to go on with it once a certain point of enlightenment or exasperation has been reached. All the liberal tricks are seen through and known now by heart. So, for better or for worse, parliamentary rule is finished. The liberal hero of the farce staged in the English parliament, and the Tory villain, can no longer draw the electorate. The day of that pantomime is past. But the liberal hero has pre-sun party, he was not the great professional, that he always has been, for nothing. So he transformed himself into a reformist socialist or Fabian or social democrat, and there he is, in the person for instance of Mr. Ramsay MacDonald, still going strong, still with the noble bearing and rather long hair of his old liberal days. But slowly he is becoming the villain of the piece. It is very complex and we need not go into it very much, but the communist left wing has stolen his thunders. His reform, beside communist reform, appears very insipid. His high respectability and professional scruples would not allow him to compete with this ultra-radical, desperate, ungentlemanly interloper. So he is gradually being forced into the relay of the Tory the villain of the political piece. The competition in the matter of liberal or radical principles having become so hot, and all the personnel having moved bodily into the left, the sham fight meantime having become a real one, all political struggle is well over the Dexter line of social revolution, everyone today is somewhere on the left, all except fascism which is a faction of the extreme and militant left who have burst round and through to the right, as it were, circumnavigated, box the compass. But from whichever side he is attacked and whether geographically he is on the left or the right of his immediate opponent, the liberal, in whatever disguise, henceforth will remain the villain of the piece. He will always popularly be in the wrong. The principal conflict today, then, is between the democratic and liberal principle on the one side, of which Kautsky is a typical continental exponent and on the other the principle of dictatorship of which Lenin was the protagonist and first great theorist, proving triumphantly in action what he had arrived at speculatively beforehand. He discarded all the confusions that the legacy of a century of liberal thought involved, and all the concepts of democracy and mass control were rooted out of his system. Thus purged, it presents itself as something highly abstract and elemental. An extreme version of Leninist politics, 
Although, making its entrance from the opposite end, it is still weighted with a great many impure elements of an opposite order to those impairing Sovietism, is Fathismo. Or, if you like, it is Leninism adapted to an ancient and intelligent population. Very roughly it can be said that in a country where the chief resistance to be overcome is in the aristocratic class, the revolutionary dictatorship must appear dressed as a mujik. In a democratic country like Italy or France, it would probably affect its purpose best in a nationalist and slightly aristocratic uniform. But there can be no arbitrary rules, only regional and racial expediency can count in the particular color given to these adjustments. They must all ultimately reach the same objective. Under the heading Kautsky vs. Lenin, in Lansbury's Labor Weekly, April 25, 1925, the general socialist opinion of Kautsky, and with him is associated Ramsay MacDonald as the chief representative of democratic opinion in England, is clearly expressed. It is very exactly the position of Sorel as regards such people as Kautsky, or would be the attitude that Lenin would have advocated. This book is his, Kautsky's, admission that his Marxism has been vulgarized into a creed of petty bourgeois opportunism and liberal go slow. But what is important for us at the moment is that Kautsky is not an isolated phenomenon, and Kautskyanism not a purely German creed. The doctrine preached in this book is but typical of the whole outlook and historical relay of the Second International. In this country we have McDonaldism, flesh of the flesh and blood of the blood of Kautskyanism, and today many of our best workers in the labor movement are still tied by bonds of tradition and personal loyalties to those who preach this very creed. Those, then, are the opposing principles in the non-revolutionized countries today. All other issues are negligible, the facades of the old party system still left standing you can walk behind and find nothing there but a few underpaid officials holding them up, on the one side is the principle of democracy, parliamentarianism, or liberal go slow, as it is called above. On the other is the policy of dictatorship, or Leninism. The first of these two policies is pacific and non-catastrophic. The second, Leninism, is orthodoxly Marxian in that it is catastrophic. Chapter 2. The Democratic State and its Monopoly of Indirectness. In part, the term revolution was defined in a sense that gave it the widest interpretation. And indeed today it has to cover more things than most people suppose. Revolutionary is, as, said, a sensational, reverberating word. But it applies to many of the most respectable things already officially established amongst us. Much recent Tory and liberal legislation is as revolutionary as any Sovietic enactments, only, as it occurs under an ostensibly old-fashioned parliamentary regime, it is not recognized as such. The spectacular violence of the Reds or Communists attracts our eye like a fiercely gesticulating puppet, meanwhile the Tory legislator is quietly drawing up, behind a heavy, respectable, official screen, communist measures, also anti-communist measures. His left hand imposes on the nation a communist measure, his right hand signs a decree consigning a batch of communists to prison. In the press of all parties we have a close-up only of his right hand, covered with capitalist jewelry, with exquisitely manicured nails. All these automatic hands, whether painted red or painted white, are doing the work of revolution, in the sense of that radical spiritual revaluation to which we are all committed. What is this revolution that can take here one form, there another, that is as far removed from the primitive humanitarian notion of the rising and reigning of the sans culotte as it is from that of a limited bourgeois brotherhood, that does not aim merely at a passing revenge of the unfortunate on the fortunate, but envisages rather the purification and ordering of the world from top to bottom? That it is not my task on this occasion to show. I have set out only to clear a little space in the midst of the ruins of our society, where a few of the advantages of the future society, that everything so clearly prognosticates, and whose outlines, in the aspirations of a few political thinkers, artists, and scholars, are distinctly seen, can be enjoyed by those who care to avail themselves of certain facilities here specified. But in order to arrive at that slight clearance, it is necessary to some extent to give an answer to that question. The political ferment expressed by the fierce opposition of the principles of democracy or liberalism on the one hand, and dictatorship on the other, resolves itself into the secular question of the one and the many, of a unification of the world or of a plurality of control, of the rule of the minority or the majority, rule by a show of hands or rule by the most vigorous and intelligent. On one side and the other there are many schools of thought. Some, for instance, believe that a vast staff of people should be maintained to live parasitically on and exploit the stupidity of the general mass. Others are of opinion that things can work out in such a way that half the world can take in the washing of the other half, and that mutually these two sleepy halves can live, and sleep, on each other. Another school of thought contends that very gradually this mass can be wakened to a sense of responsibility, but that under no circumstances must it be brusque. 
This is the school to which Kautsky, MacDonald, Russell, etc., belong. Frederick the Great of Prussia, that famous ruler, thought that in condescending to rule, with the assistance of his hydics and grooms, he had gone as far as could be expected of a man of his caliber. There is a story that he astonished someone attempting to represent him as a kind and much-loved father of his people, by suddenly and dramatically delivering himself of the following quotation. Quae moi le human que je trop su connaître maritant pu, monsieur, conde netre lor mater. That snub expressed his sentiments more truly than his treatise anti-Machiavel. Henry IV of France can be regarded as an early ideal liberal, certainly one of the greatest. He also represents the highest reach of Gallic statesmanship. He was as humane, tolerant, and rational a ruler as it is possible to get, in combination with great vigor. He never revenged himself, he was at once thrifty, and fond of life, he was a courteous, just, and amiable prince, and he was, of course, stabbed in the stomach at last for his pains. Machiavelli showed, and no one has ever been able seriously to dispute it, that government must be carried on, and can only be successful, if the nature of the governed is thoroughly taken into account, and regarded extremely coldly in an extremely matter-of-fact way. The citizens of Plato's Republic are hypothetic, they do not exist, but are optimistic phantoms of philosophy, and you cannot make bricks without straw. Yet his Republic is humanly desirable, if there is any sense in the word humanly, since there are so few creatures who answer that description. In this way it is inevitable that you should arrive at the notion of the will of the greatest number, the dogma of what the public wants. What the will of the greatest number may be is consequently the capital question of statesmanship. And it is discovered, at first with a certain surprise, that nothing that can properly be called will exist for anything except a series of things that can conveniently be catalogued under that famous catchword, what the public wants. These resolve themselves into a simple series of disconnected appetites. But far more than this has always been forced on people, a luxurious, hypothetical surplus. As a result of the dogma of what the public wants, and the technical experiences of the publicist, a very cynical and unflattering view of what the public is is widely held today. And, indeed, the contemporary public, corrupted and degraded into a semi-imbecility by the operation of this terrible canon of press and publicity technique, by now confirms its pessimism. It has learned to live up to, or down to, its detractor. So in speaking of the public we must speak of that sad product of publicity that we see around us. It is inevitable that men who had escaped or resisted the general dementia should, surveying the fruits of liberal enlightenment and press control, at last formulate a counter-doctrine. Why turn yourself into the eternal servant of an imbecile, they then exclaim, or, in the Christian idiom, of the halt in the blind, or condemn yourself to teach the alphabet in an infant class forever? Why not rule, would not that be simpler? That is the natural reaction of the best contemporary statesmanship to the fruits of what the public wants. Having arrived at this point, we are confronted with two figures, who remark that it is not worthwhile to rule men, and that all rule is evil, respectively. The first is excellently symbolized by Frederick the Great, who proceeds, of course, to rule men as they have seldom been ruled before. The second would be symbolized by Count Tolstoy, who did not believe in authority. He considered that no man should have power over another, and that authority in itself is evil. It is this second type of man to which the Soviet rulers especially object for he is casting contempt on what they regard, rightly, as their predestined function, namely, to be rulers, men organizing and legislating for human beings as they are, not as they should be. They cover with scorn, in consequence, the intellectual who does not wish to stain his lily-white hands with such a sort of thing as power. Power, they say, is good. As to Frederick the Great, they would have more sympathy with him. But it is unlikely that they would regard it as essential, as he did, to shed tears after a battle on beholding the destruction for which he was responsible, or to protest, as Frederick did, how much he disliked governing, how distasteful the cruel things to which, because, alas, he was a ruler, he was committed were to him. On the contrary, with a peculiar candor they express their will to rule, their delight in power. And here we reach a point that must often have been observed by anyone surveying at all intelligently the duel of communism and capitalism, of fascism and democracy, of the East and the West, for it is roughly that. It is a paradox of that situation that all the frankness is on one side, and that is not on the side of the West, of democracy. All the traditional obliquity and subterranean methods of the Orient are, in this duel, exhibited by the Westerner and the democratic regime. It is we who are the Machiavels, compared to the Sovietist or the Fascist, who makes no disguise of his forcible intentions, whose power is not wrapped up in parliamentary humbug, who is not eternally engaged in pretenses of benefaction 
who does not say at every move in the game that he is making it for somebody else's good, that he is a vicar and a servant when he is a master. It is true that he promises happiness to the masses as a result of his iron rule. But the iron is not hidden, or camouflaged as Christian charity. He says that one politics in a country, one indisputed government, will be for the good of the average man. And when these one-party states are centrally organized, as Italy is becoming, who can gainsay him? This contrast of directness and indirectness was very patent during the war. The undiplomatic, unmachiavellian frankness of the German method of war appeared to the Anglo-Saxon consciousness, so used to make belief, as diabolical. What the German was direct about, or much that Fathismo or the Soviet is direct about, is extremely barbarous. But much that Western democracy is indirect about is barbarous as well. All I wish to emphasize is a new factor, a political openness and directness, the initiative in which democracy cannot claim. Russian society for 50 years before the revolution was painfully confused, dragged this way and that by its liberalism and mysticism, as the great Russian writers witness. The Sovietic power has put an end to all that painful confusion as though by magic. The means were terrible ones, the Bolsheviks did not believe in gradualness and biologic growth, perhaps, enough. Many of the means taken to create the new state are no doubt susceptible of infinite improvement. And the most difficult task of any real, that is, powerful and severe form of government is to reconcile the requirements of authority with the personal initiative that is impatient of rules, and which yet must not be crushed unless you wish to rule machines, not men. Nothing on earth today can overthrow such powers as the Soviet or Fathismo. The Sovietic or the fascist chiefs, like other people, have to do the best they can with the material to their hand, and they are not perfect themselves. What they have done in a short time in the way of organization must be the admiration of the world. Chapter 3 no end of the world in social revolution. Having done my best to remove the kind of general verbal misunderstanding where the sensational word revolution is concerned, I can very briefly offer an interpretation of the great cluster of movements disrupting our time. The first thing to notice about it is its implacableness, inasmuch as no local success will satisfy it. It is not any personality, nation, or even particular ruling class that is aimed at, but an entire human revaluation. That is, of course, why it is more like a religion than a rebellion. It is as though a mind had placed itself over against the world and formed the resolve to reconstitute the human idea itself. It is the whole of humanity this time that is at stake. The philosopher's dissatisfaction with the human animal expresses itself at the heart of this disturbance, rather even than the outraged prophets disgust at the way men treat each other. The oppression of the poor by the rich is associated with the stultification of the great by the small. The stupid rich is the enemy and, strange as that might sound, it is the small who are the real villains of the peace. It is much more the senseless competition of a false independence, the chaos of a multitude of ineffective, pretentious, and discordant wills, that it is sought to reduce to order, than the overthrow of this ephemeral plutocracy or that. That this fanatical and grandiose conception is not necessarily tucked away inside the head of any subordinate official of this vast change, or shared even by all its promoters, is no doubt true but nothing short of such a conception can adequately account for its scope, implacability, and power. At least one am unable to imagine any other. We are in the presence, I think, of a religious rather than a political intelligence, or rather, as in all primitive societies these two things are one, in the presence of an unspoilt and primitive source whose will is so great that it clothes itself naturally in the form of a god. That any such movement must float itself at first on some great emotional tide is plain and it is inevitable that it should take a class form rather than a national form. The nation as a unit is not universal enough for its purposes, only the class is general enough, and the subject or slave class bulky enough both helpless and immense, pathetic enough, and primitive enough, to answer to its requirements. It is really an idea, in the sense that we have seen Fuyi interpreting a certain class of ideas for us, that is, a forcible emotion wrapped up in an ideologic covering, fixed and, as it were, embalmed in the intellect. It is in the exactest sense idealistic. As such its natural enemy is the great group of emotions of a natural order, the filial and family emotions. All the organizations and habits that attach people to life in its ordinary sense, those of the state and family notably, stand between it and its realization. Saint Columba was the saint of a similar religious upheaval for affronting and overcoming these deepest human affections in favor of the greatest abstract love of God. How near in many ways primitive Christianity was to the present revolution has often been pointed out. It claimed to the convert the same fanatical allegiance, was international in the same way, and hostile to organized social life. Sir Samuel Dill, in speaking of the contemporary objections to evangelical Christianity on this score, writes. 
and there is some of the religious literature of that period which gives a color to part of this indictment. In the very years when the great invasions were desolating the provinces of the West, and when the hosts of Radogaisus and Alaric were threatening the heart of the empire, S. Paulinus wrote a remarkable letter to a soldier who felt himself drawn to the higher Christian life. In this epistle the ascetic ideal is expounded with a breadth and absence of qualification which shock and amaze the modern reader. The evangelical counsels of perfection are construed in the sternest and most uncompromising fashion. Christian obedience is boldly represented as inconsistent with the duties of citizenship and the relations of family life. The love of father or mother, of wife or child, the desire for riches or honor, devotion to one's country, are all so many barriers to keep the soul from Christ. There is not a word to indicate that a Christian life, worthy of the name, could be made compatible with the performance of worldly duties. The rich are condemned forever, in the words of prophet or evangelist. The soldier is a mere shedder of blood, doomed to eternal torment. There is no possibility of serving both Christ and Caesar. This was the way in which secular life was regarded by the voluntary exiles who followed St. Jerome, such a movement might well seem to an old-fashioned Roman as a renunciation, not only of citizenship, but of all the hard-won fruits of civilization and social life. If this was the highest form of Christian life, as its devotees proclaimed it to be, then Christianity was the foe, not only of the old religion, but of the social and political order which Rome had given to the world. It is hardly to be wondered at that the monks were execrated alike by the mob and by the cultivated pagan noble. Last century of the Western Empire. The ways in which these two movements differ from each other is as easy to see as their points of comparison. The heavenly kingdom was not essentially different to the promise of proletarian participation in a higher terrestrial life, because the world was to be destroyed almost at once prior to its establishment, and its rewards and benefits were very concrete. Today, however, the promises on this plane are realizable. There is no necessity to postulate the suppression of the world for its advent, for the goods are there to hand over. People can manufacture their own heaven, the All-Father or Father Christmas is science. But the plan does not end with this animal bounty and static salvation. The Christian otherworldliness was far more worldly and limited than the present objective. The Christian heaven is thrown in here, as it were, as a practical inducement to allow at last the freeing of the human mind for tasks of a higher order. It is both more positive and more aristocratic, to use that convenient term to discriminate it from the usurpation of Christian altruism. That is its great and valuable difference. Chapter 4. The doctrine of what the public wants originates in the pessimism of philosophy. On a previous page the true complexion of the incentive force of the revolutionary change proposed was said to be the philosophic dissatisfaction with the human animal. But this dissatisfaction, unless its motives were felt to be rather purer than what is at the back of most complaints about other people, would with reason be resented as presumptuous. Certainly if the average stockbroker complained of the shortcomings, on grounds of insensitiveness of an intellectual or moral nature, of the plain man, the plain man would be fully justified in retorting that this censorious financier should examine the beam in his own eye first. But there is nothing philosophical or speculative about the great business interests that control us. Therefore, if a philosophic dissatisfaction with the human animal exists, and if it is that, and the interest threatened by it, that provides the basis of social revolution, it must come from the philosopher, or intellectual, not the business executive. This is in fact the case. Everything that makes revolution valuable comes from the scientific, philosophic, and discursive intelligence. But has the most imaginative, inventive, and resourceful of human beings the right to complain of and criticize the average of his kind? He evidently has not, although it could be conceded that he has more right probably than has the stockbroker. Also it could be conceded that probably his motives are purer, at least he does not rob and murder the less talented, less alive, more savage of his kind, making the excuse of his disgust at their mediocrity. That is, however, too much what the financier is apt to do. But how is it that the financier speaks the language of philosophy, and takes over the watchwords and fiercely reformist temper of revolution? That is, of course, the key or a democratic society. It is the vulgarization of scientific and philosophic thought that provides him with his mighty excuse to enslave and change as he likes. That is another thing in favor of open, direct, and avowed rule. The fascist and Soviet governments have done with revolution, they do not rule in the name of the intelligence, they quite rightly repudiate this bastard, vulgarized article, but by right of political economic intelligence and political economic power. The philosopher has never considered it as part of his function to flatter people. But his most unflattering attitude has never been so unflattering, if considered for a moment, as is the flattery of the what the public wants idea. But the theory or philosophy of what the public wants would never have come into existence without, one, 
the democratic, enlightened regime of modern Europe, and, two, the center of the moralist, criticism of the philosopher, inhumanity of the scientist, and superbia of the Napoleonism of Nietzsche. At the beginning of this part of my essay I have placed a characteristic piece of hortative, moralistic censoriousness from the anatomy of melancholy. But Burton can be matched by a scientist of our day, Professor Richet, who writes very much in the same strain of good-hearted but rather stupid abuse. In order to trace the philosophy of what the public wants, with which we are now about to deal, to its origins, I will quote a few passages from this distinguished French liberal man of science. It is to such unflattering generalizations as Professor Richet's in the past that all the insulting accommodation of what the public wants can be traced. Many people, he says, will doubtless be astonished that in comparing animals with men, I constantly find the animal less stupid. Certainly at a first superficial examination we might be tempted to think that man's intelligence is incomparably higher than that of animals. But, stupidity does not mean that we have not understood, but that we act as if we had not understood. To know that which is good, and to do that which is bad, knowingly and deliberately to inflict pain upon ourselves, to recognize the cause of unhappiness and to fling ourselves upon that cause, that is stupidity. The war was what stirred Professor Richet into this declamatory little book. That terrible blow to all hopes of civilization and a humaner, happier life apparently took him down from his professorial chair into the marketplace. How few people it affected in that way. You must admire the gesture of this old Frenchman, and the soundness of his heart so ill served by his judgment. The fitting out of an armored cruiser, he says, is, from certain points of view, a demonstration of stupendous intelligence. Neither rabbits, cats, nor even monkeys could do as much as this, powerful engines, wireless telegraphy, huge guns of increasing accuracy, electric power directing the entire mechanism, luxurious staterooms, picked libraries, and swift hydroplanes. What perfection! The ingenious arrangement of the whole structure enables us to sail without any risk on all seas, with all the wonders of civilization accumulated in this narrow space. How beautiful! I am lost in admiration. But presently, when, think it over, my admiration evaporates so completely that no trace of it remains. For when all is said and done, what is the goal of this wonderful machine? To destroy a similar machine, therefore, to what end? It is not enough to create ingenious works. If they bring about pain, illness, wounds, and poverty, they show the stupidity of their creator. Aviation is a very fine thing, a decisive victory over gravity, that relentless gravity which seemed destined to keep us tied to earth until the end of time, and give a due reverence. But when we make it the essential function of aerial machines to scatter bombs and terror over peaceful towns at midnight, then at once my admiration withers, and, prefer the society of the penguins and the bisons, who know nothing of aviation. What happens in a war? What values reign? He asks. Take the Great War as a specimen. The flood of suffering caused by the war was a hundred, a thousandfold worse than the bloodshed. Al, justice scorned, all falsehood exalted, all pity insulted the whole of humanity wallowing happily in blood and slime. During five or six thousand years man had tried his strength in continuous, but comparatively bloodless, little wars. But these were sketchy, childish efforts, mere preludes to the magnificent work accomplished in 1914-18. Ah! This time he has achieved success. The sum of human sorrows has exceeded all forecasts, even the most optimistic. And then he comes to the Nietzschean or Sorlian problem of heroism. The more energy, fortitude, and heroism exacted by the war, the more glaringly it exposed our madness, since these virtues were dedicated to destruction. Humanity is like a sultan who has two wives. One is young, beautiful, and healthy, radiantly graceful and sweet, with a musical voice, dazzling charms, and eyes alight with tenderness and love. To her husband she gives pleasure, mirth, and serenity. She is science. The other wife is a dirty old hag, abject, blear-eyed, a walking skeleton. She has only a few scanty tufts of gray hair thick with vermin, toothless jaws, and fetid breath, a body ravaged by disgusting ulcers and covered with filth. She is violent, full of lies and fury, given to fits of frenzied rage, she foams and bites. She roars instead of speaking. Even from afar she stinks. She is war. And yet, nevertheless, she is the favorite wife of this egregious fool. This is rather an emotional outburst than anything else. It is only by intellect, not by indignation and emotionality, any more than by geniality and jokes, that the terrestrial paradise can be attained. He feels the same about Homo sapiens, whom he calls Homo stultus, as does Mr. Shaw, but he is angrier and more benevolent. In the rather unfortunate Sultan simile, 
after reading which any woman's mind would be adversely affected, he places mankind in the position of an all-powerful potentate, able to embrace either the paradises of science or the loathsomeness of war. Was an image ever less accurate? And of that particular sort of emotional inaccuracy that does far more harm than good to the cause it espouses. To picture mankind, the Poilu, the Tommy, the Picklehauber, etc., rushing willfully on war from sheer love of war, and hatred of the fleshpots of peaceful life they left behind, is so ridiculous that even the goodness of Professor Richet's intentions do not excuse it. In an earlier page he referred to the asset side of war, undeniably, he said, war brings great happiness to some men, and he indicated the armament manufacturers and war profiteers. But do these people wait, patiently and without interference, for such lucky accidents as wars to occur? The falsity of the mankind the Sultan notion is patent. Mankind is, alas, as helpless as the animals, as the professor's penguins or bisons, and therefore is amenable to the excuses provided for the animals on the score of ignorance. It is the abstraction mankind, the homo stultus or the homo sapiens, when there are men who gain and men who lose by everything that occurs, when what is one man's food is another man's poison, and what it is foolish for one man to engage in it is wise for another, that makes such nonsense of this book of Professor Richet's. It is a myth like Ohm Eclairé that trips up his reason, and uses up his emotion in vain. Why all this anger and indignation, then, with mankind, or with men in general? They are helpless, but they do not mind dying very much, in a state of nature, as Professor Perry and others have pointed out, and as the Aborigine shows, they are not very violent or given to war. They are rather quiet and reasonable animals than otherwise, though of course superstitious, and addicted to the use of feathers, which Professor Richet finds very ridiculous. To describe the carnage of the war as willed by the majority of men, in some static excess, is so stupid that it is almost too stupid. If you tickle the sole of the foot of a sane man he temporarily loses his reason. When excited, confused, worked up, drugged, and shrieked at by the magnate in his press for a few weeks, mankind, homo stultus, becomes ferocious, that is all. Mankind is part of the machinery of the democratic flattery of democracy. Democracy is to blame for the war, also for Professor Richet and his inability to understand the war. Everything that abstraction mankind is made to do himself he is, since he democratically rules himself, does he not? Responsible for, it is he who has willed it. So now you've a been and gone and killed 15 million of yourself, have you? The profiteer might have asked him in 1918. Well, you are a silly fellow. Still, you would do it, you bloodthirsty, homicidal devil. Dash, can't stop you. There's no holding you in when you see red, is there? Ah, well. You rule yourself, thank goodness for that, or you might start blaming me for it. But I suppose after all a bit of a scrap does you no harm occasionally. Boys will be boys. I'm glad I'm not your father. I shouldn't like to be responsible for such a high-spirited, fiery, tigerish devil as you. Straight I wouldn't. And poor mankind in his concrete form of the plain man, mutilated, bankrupt, and brutalized, would have looked at that genial, kindly face, with its merry Pequickian twinkle and plausible tongue, not a bit proud. A self-made fellow, evidently. Good luck to him, with a grim smile, and would think to himself, yes, I am a bit of a devil. There in Professor Richet you have the enlightened, despairing, liberal intelligence of our times, and how futile it is. Chapter 5. The Vulgarization of Disgust. The critical dissatisfaction of the scientific and philosophic mind where human capacity is concerned is not novel. Vulgarization is the novelty. Another novelty is the vulgarity of the governing mercantile class, side by side with the extraordinary intellectual resources of the intellectual. The effect of the vulgarization on the ruler is at least as significant as its effect on the man in the street. Philosophers or men of science, witnessing the popular miscarriage of their thought, are disgusted or resigned, as the case may be. The democratic ruler, who alone is responsible for the worst and most calamitous miscarriages, associates himself with them and in chorus they all abuse the poor plain man. What has happened is that disgust has been vulgarized. This is more deadly in its effects than the vulgarization of knowledge. The natural insolence and desire for a feeling of superiority of those who are superior in nothing but money and the power it gives, is thus provided. And the noble pessimism of the speculative mind is at once translated into acts, and employed as a sanction for exploitation. The whole of this new system of governmental metaphysic can be best defined as the philosophy of what the public wants. The form that government in the Western democratic countries takes being publicity, suggestion, persuasion, and at education, the full significance for the community of this cynical dogma cannot be exaggerated. 
I will attempt to formulate more explicitly than one of its adepts would be able to do, or would care to do, probably, the principle of the dogma of what the public wants. Its similarity to the philosopher's cry of despair from which it derives will in this way be brought out. Let us imagine, then, an adept of this dogma summarizing his principles for the benefit of some budding publicist. In the candor of the confessional, heart to heart with a secure postulant, they would run as follows. Take the poorest and most abject cretin in the community, 80%, of which resemble him very nearly. Say to yourself, there is nothing too simple and inhumanly stupid the sort of thing that gives you that empty feeling in the pit of the stomach for this low-grade fool. It would take you 500 centuries to teach him to frame the simplest abstract notion. He is permanently and forever an infant, the infant's class always absorbs 80%. Of the personnel of our famous terrestrial training school, or technical institute, which we call mankind. The eternal alphabet A, B, C, D is the music that, in one form or another, would greet a visitor from another planet come to see how we were getting on. This repartition of the fairy's gifts, leaving this vast human surplus practically cretinesque, you must accept. It is not your doing, you did not make the world. You can do nothing to modify it, and even if you could, are you sure that you would not be going against providence? There is a possibility that a wisdom superior to yours arranged things in this way. Abandon, therefore, all those queer attempts to educate this dense throng of anapertiva mankind, or rather, canalize your educative efforts in such a way that only the simplest instruction is provided, nothing that will tax those truly infantile intelligences. For they are as truly infantile as what more technically is an infant, and the same rule not to overtax and overstrain this undeveloped brain applies to them as to the child, so, A, B, C, D, 2 and 2 make 4, donkey tap the door. 3 and 3 make 6, lamps, not tramps, have wicks, Compare the American army tests of Yerkes and others, whatever you consider it possible or desirable to impart to them, let it be on that system. From these ineluctable premises and observations, as you will see, a vast system of government ensues. Although we have called this prodigious mass of people infantile, they of course outwardly grow up. They do not call themselves infantile as a community. They claim to be treated as responsible, accomplished, intelligent beings. They want to have official bulletins every morning of all the accidents, fires, murders, rapes that have occurred throughout the night and part of the preceding day. They wish a detailed account of how their agents and ministers of state have fulfilled their trust, as they call it, in the conduct of that great and sacred affair, the Commonwealth. And they wish to be informed punctually of the results of all racing, bull games, paper chases, bullfights, and other similar events. The what the public wants method of meeting these demands is the best and only one, see our advert. It is run on the lines outlined above. Something in the form of the enthralling adventures of Bo Peep and Patsy is essential to wreathe all their rosy faces in happy smiles. Then a hush will come at the sight of a heading, War Cloud in the East or War Cloud in the West. Father will frown, exclaiming, I say. Things look serious. Then the infant's class will be led into the deepest and dirtiest secrets of the underworld of Westminster in a column of the most wildly indiscreet gossip. It is an open secret, among those in the know it is freely whispered in the lobbies and closets of the talking house, that Mr. Chamberlain will shortly make an announcement that will surprise three of his colleagues and most intimate cronies very much indeed, unless, as may of course happen, it comes to their ears, for there is always the chance that they may get wind of it. Mr. Citizen looks very knowing at this. He has indeed got his penneth. The same great principles laid down above apply to the cinema, wireless, and theatre. Unless you wish to give yourself quite unnecessary trouble, involve yourself in a considerable money loss, and become very unpopular, in these occupations, as in everything else, you must follow the golden rule, namely, you cannot aim too low. The story you present cannot be too stupid. It is not only impossible to exaggerate, it in itself requires a trained publicist to form any idea of, the idiocy of the public. In general it can be said that no confidence trick is too transparent to dupe them with, no picture of life is too unreal or sugary for their taste, no mental effort is too slight not to arouse an immediate and indignant protest from them. That, I suppose, would be the main statement. But associated with the stupidity of the public is also its malignity. C.F. Riche stupidity and ferocity are even made for each other. When you have a lot of one, you cannot have too much of the other. There is a further point, this credo can be imagined as proceeding, this great mass with which you have to live and deal as best you can is not either reliable, truthful, possessed of the slightest magnanimity or kindness, or any of the things that would make it easy to get on with. However much you trick it, it will not fall short of you in cunning, but only in ability, you will never trick it as much as it would like to trick you. 
cf, because this is to be asserted in general of men, that they are ungrateful, fickle, false, cowards, covetous, and as long as you succeed they are yours entirely, they will offer you their blood, property, life, children, as is said above. Friendships that are obtained by payment, and not by greatness, are not secured, etc., etc. Machiavelli. So, ethically, even, your adherence to the doctrine of what the public wants is justified by the mechanicity of human nature, just as intellectually you are forced to the procedures laid down in that doctrine by human stupidity. The most bitter philosopher, Machiavelli, just quoted, as an example, would not speak very differently to this. But the doctrine of what the public wants begins where philosophy leaves off. And in the case of this belief it is not so much the truth of what it states, as of the uses to which this discovery is put and the spirit in which it is held. Nothing useful to the world was ever accomplished as a result of such a belief steadily held, nothing at least but a work of hatred, which has its creative uses, no doubt, as Jures thought. What on the analogy of the dyer's hand it usually produces, except for the moments during which it is engaged in epic destruction, is something inconceivably common and barren. Professor Richet or the author of The Anatomy of Melancholy, one a man of science and the other a divine, would thus agree with a great profit of what the public wants to a large extent in their estimate of the public. But they would act quite differently on this information. The latter would rub his hands with satisfaction, and approach the public with an obsequious grin, and a what can, do for you today, my little man? Professor Richet, his face convulsed with angry discouragement, would rush out and apostrophize his semblable, his frere. Hideous and undesirable as is the caricature of the private thoughts of the philosopher contained in what the public wants theory, yet the pessimistic original cannot be neglected. If the creative minds of the world are indeed forever cancelled and rendered ineffective by the agency of the unprogressive mass of men, then they should be protected and rescued. This is of more importance than the gratification of the vanity of the human average, the human average would get more out of such a salvage than out of those satisfactions for which it pays the expert of what the public wants so dearly. Left at the mercy of this vast average, its inertia, creative hatred, and conspiratorial habits where the new is concerned, we shall always checkmate ourselves. The more we advance, the more we shall lose ground. In the ultimate interest of all of us we should sacrifice anything to the end that this most priceless power of any, the intellectual power by which, as a kind, we express and illustrate ourselves, precisely because of which we are conscious of our poor organization and the fatuity of our record up to date, be put in a position finally to be effective. Instead of the vast organization to exploit the weaknesses of the many, should we not possess one for the exploitation of the intelligence of the few? Does the public really want what the public wants? In a sense, no doubt, it does. But it would not want to be flattered on such a gigantic scale if it knew what this flattery cost it. Again, what the public wants, as it is practiced today, must lead its practitioner into lunacy or some form of imbecility, or else, with the stronger-minded and more cynical, into a mood of hatred where their millions of little charges are concerned. Hatred of stupidity must result, where it is not succumbed to, in those whose business it is to be incessantly isolating and exploiting it. But a great specialist in stupidity, like one of the great original newspaper kings, could only become what he does thanks to the clairvoyance of hatred of some sort. The great journalist and publicity figures with which everybody is familiar probably started with an intense irritation and dislike of the stupidity out of which subsequently they made their great fortunes. What started in hatred and contempt, passing to mastery and fortune, has been seen sometimes to end in madness. Hatred of stupidity is a most dangerous thing to encourage in yourself or others. It must have as a policy, or widely indulged in practice, the most diabolical results. Then, again, to hate stupidity is really to hate failure, for stupidity is that. And although the Christian attitude on this point does not of necessity recommend itself, it is better than what we are familiar with under the form of the worship of success but to love stupidity would be even worse, no doubt. Self-sacrifice in the interest of the lame, the halt, and the blind is the extreme theoretic, Christian, form of that. It cannot be said to have succeeded, in that sense it has practiced what it preached. An entirely different attitude either from that of Christianity or from what the public wants, towards the majority of mankind, having no trace of disgust or dislike, hatred or impossible unreal love, seems to suggest itself as necessary for the new ruler of the world. It is no doubt as unkind and as great a waste of time to give the public what it doesn't want, in the way of art, literature, or science, as it is to degrade it below what it does actually want in order to make more money out of it. If you must treat the public as animals in a vast zoo, you should at least observe the usual rule for such places, namely, do not irritate the animals. 
Why not be satisfied with the public as it is, and let it amuse itself as it pleases? If you yourself have other ideas of amusement, then it is always open to you to turn from that humdrum human fare and occupy yourself in some other way without offending anybody. Chapter 6. Bolshevik Will to Power. Marx invited the other countries of Europe, in his time, to gaze at England, for in England they would see their own future, of fifty years thence, reflected, he said. England was already treading the path they in due course must tread, that was his theory. On the same principle, by scrutinizing contemporary Russia or Italy we today can see where we shall be some years hence. We can get there without catastrophe. The present rulers of Russia or Italy, we must assume, are imbued with a creative, compassionate emotion for the human being. But they are intelligent enough to perceive, it seems, that he is a very helpless child, dependent on others, like a horse or dog. They realize that he finds his greatest happiness in a state of dependence and subservience when, an important condition, it is named freedom. It matters very little, then, if you outrage often, as you must do to rule successfully, the most elementary principles of freedom. He will be happier with you, dependent, than with other people, independent. Men will always get their happiness out of words, whatever is popularly and scientifically said to the contrary. Put a word on him, as God put his word on the Israelites, and he is yours, and as happy as an enthusiastic dog. But the wise ruler, and I am assuming that in the world today there is really such a ruler, would see quite well if I am correct, has seen, that there must be a master. Someone or other, has to assume responsibility for the ignorant millions. And their expression of their willingness and determination to assume power, even to wrest power from those who abuse it, where necessary is the personal announcement on the part of the Russian rulers, or the rulers of Italy, of their accepting this situation. A very interesting book has recently appeared on the questions that are occupying us here. It is called After Lenin, and is by Michael Farben. Mr. Farben, I gather, is an independent, non-partisan observer. But he is undoubtedly very much in sympathy with the Soviet regime, and very well informed. At this point I will make a fairly long quotation from his book. He deals with great candor and clearness with the facts as they present themselves to him. We could not, I think, have a better guide, or one whose conclusions correspond more nearly with those I am expressing throughout this essay. The important point to grasp, he writes, in any consideration of the political future of Russia is the fact that a new ruling class is being evolved. Russia has never been so fortunate as to possess a ruling class in the European sense of that word. Certainly the nobility was, traditionally, the first order in the empire. But the nobles never actually exercised real power, though the bureaucracy was recruited from them it was in fact independent of them as a class. It was, indeed, independent of any class, absolutely isolated. Certainly the monarchy and bureaucracy were accustomed to invoke the name of the nobility in any reform they initiated. But, as a matter of fact, the nobility, having no instrument of publicity in their hands, had never any direct or immediate say in such matters. And though the monarchy was permeated with the feudal ideas of the nobility, the nobility was in no proper sense the ruling class. The nobles had many privileges but no political power. They were the foundation of the state, but they could make no claim to being the state. The merchants, the bourgeoisie, on the other hand, had infinitely less influence in state affairs than the nobles. Not even in an elementary form could they acquire the position of a ruling class. The peculiarity, of political life in Russia has been the complete absence of the party system. There were many groups in opposition, but a party in power never existed. No party, up to the creation of the Duma, ever contemplated the possibility of assuming power. The revolutionary parties, too, though determined to smash all and every government, never contemplated the idea of assuming themselves the government of the country, and indeed were entirely opposed to taking any part in it. Members of Russian revolutionary parties have generally been intellectuals of the Dostoevsky type, idealists and dreamers, introspective, doubting, hesitating, diffident. Propagandists and conspirators, they were never men of action, they never even expected to have to act, except perhaps in a spasmodic and impulsive fashion. These men showed themselves capable of great self-sacrifice, but, when the success of the revolution of 1917 threw them up and they were called to assume power in the state, they proved themselves not only inexperienced, as might have been expected, but timid and perverse. At the very moment when the West was looking for the arrival of the strong man who should dissolve this hopeless chaos, of the early days of the revolution and stem this flood of words, Lenin emerged. Lenin supplied what had always been lacking in previous Russian parties, a program and a purpose. The organized and businesslike persistence of the little group of Bolsheviks was bound to meet with success, for they brought with them new methods of political activity and a relation to life quite unusual in Russia. 
What was new and really surprisingly new about, the Bolsheviks, was the tenacity and thoroughness with which they went to work. The strict discipline and thorough organization of their underground party, the indomitable ability and energy shown in the pursuit of their aims, startled the average Russian as something not only unusual but even uncanny. These qualities were indeed so alien from the usual. National laxity that they could not but suggest a foreign origin. The more the revolution is studied, the more it becomes evident that it was Lenin's attitude to the problem of governmental power that gave him and his party the victory. Indeed, the Bolshevik attitude to power, their appetite for power, their already undeviating advance to it, and their continuous exercise and successful retention of it, constituted the crucial and unpassable line of demarcation between the Bolsheviks and the other socialist parties in Russia. There, in his admirably clear account of the conditions of the success of the Bolsheviks, Mr. Farben has shown us how it was power, a love of it, and determination to obtain it, that enabled Lenin and his small party to reach the pinnacle they did. And, as Mr. Farben started by saying, the important point to remember in any consideration of Russia is that a new ruling class is being formed, and further, that it is the first thing of that sort that the Russians have had. I will quote a few further passages from Mr. Farben's book about the attitude of the usual Russian intellectual to the problem of power, and Kerensky's relay. The Russian intellectuals had a pietistic abhorrence of power as a thing essentially evil, base, and degrading. Controlling most of the instruments of real power from the very moment of the March Revolution, the socialists were afraid not only to assume the government, but even to ask a share in it. Kerensky alone took the risk of entering the provisional government, but his decision aroused a storm of indignation among his fellow socialists, who only forgave him when he put forward the theory that he took office as a minister of justice, not in order to exercise power, but merely to secure the punishment of the enemies of the people the leading members of the old regime. In accordance with this theory, Kerensky proclaimed himself a hostage of democracy in the first provisional government, not a member of it. The Bolsheviks were the only party of the left which definitely and persistently fought for power. But this thirst for power was so contrary to the traditions of Russian political life that even the Bolshevik rank and file had time and again to be reassured by Lenin that the assumption of power was necessary and by no means wicked or degrading. Dot, this clash of opinion and divergence of attitude towards power was the main if not the only cause of the conflict between the Bolsheviks and the Russian intellectuals. It is no exaggeration to say that the Russian intellectuals not only hated but loathed the Bolsheviks for sticking to power. The Bolsheviks were certainly not behindhand in reciprocating this hatred. They ridiculed the intellectuals as too pure-minded to do the dirty work of the world and only concerned with keeping their robes unsullied, and they actually persecuted them. The success of the Bolsheviks is due solely to their capacity for responding to this new spirit of action, of enterprise, and of acceptance of life. The Bolsheviks saw a new ruling class emerging in Russia, and were astute enough to maneuver themselves into the position of its leaders. To define in set terms this ruling class is impossible at this stage. The Bolsheviks, at any rate, were not anxious to give a very strict definition of the class in whose name they assumed the government. They proclaimed that the toiling masses, whoever these may be, alone possessed political rights, they excluded the exploiting elements, an equally vague class, from any exercise of such rights, and on this foundation they based a theory which permitted them to retain power exclusively in their hands. Chapter 7. The Ruler and the Ruled. If the problem of power is envisaged by the Soviet as Mr. Farben has represented it to be, and as everything leads us to believe that it is, then it is clear that from the start the Soviet system must clash with democratic prejudice. So it is natural that the struggle for ascendancy throughout Europe should today be more or less reproducing the struggle that occurred in the first months of the revolution in Russia, and that the opposing camps resolve themselves into a set of men on the one side imbued with the notion of a rigidly disciplined obedience to a central authority with dictatorial powers, and on the other into a set of men faithful to the liberal, democratic ideal of the last century. But let us leave these young, not fully tried, powers out of the question. We will pursue the argument independently of controversial parallels. As it takes two to make a quarrel, so it takes two categories of people to rule a state, and however artificial at certain points the division may be, you must have a ruling caste, if only to satisfy the profound instinct and wish of the great majority of people to be ruled. To rule is a painful, dangerous, and arduous duty. It is only when it becomes too much of a pleasure that it is a danger for other people, namely, those who are ruled. So long as it is an unpleasant duty, involving a great deal of work, it is the indispensable ideal of human life. Most young aristocracies in their first generations are kept very busy and live hard, and in consequence answer to one of the principal requirements. This division into rulers and ruled partakes of a sexual division, or rather, 
The contrast between the one class and the other is more like that between the sexes than anything else. The ruled are the females and the rulers the males, in this arrangement. A stupid, or slow-witted, not very ambitious, conventional, slothful person, what has been called aptly only on sans well, the human average, has necessarily a great many feminine characteristics. These involve him, too, in a great many childish ones. And the relation of the ruler to the ruled is always that of a man to a woman, or of an adult to a child. By man here is meant any ruler-like person, of whatever sex, age, or class. Such a division for the purposes of ruling necessitates two distinct types of life, that of the ruled must be lived on one plane, that of the ruler on another. The life of the subject will be lived concretely, stereotyped on on a narrow, fashionable plan, of use for the day or time, full of kind, protective illusions, like a screen round a child's bed, full of nicely arranged flowers, little presents, and meaningless courtesies, a life of name days and birthdays, mechanical work, easy bursts of animal laughter, all tied up in a little neat bundle with a comfortable personal vanity. The life of the ruler, on the other hand, will be very unpleasant. It will be severe, full of the shock of the forces of outer vastness from which the masses are sheltered, full of incessant labor. The ruler must be completely disillusioned, a suspicion of belief and he would be lost, the cares of his numerous duties will prevent him from sleeping very much, he will not be able to regard life as agreeable in any way, or else, like Faust, it would be all up with him, hearty laughter or anything that we associate with bourgeois relaxation would never visit him. To be a true ruler he will have paid every penalty of man's aspiring lot, a pact with the devil included. It often occurs, and we even have today a unique picture of this in contemporary Western society, that the ruler becomes a confirmed practitioner of one of Harun al-Rashid's most objectionable habits, namely, that of spending his time disguised amongst his subjects as one of them. This tendency on a ruler is very much indeed to be deplored. No good has ever been known to come of it. And such an arrangement should always be resented and resisted by the ruled. The determination to have the apple and eat it too is not the sign of a very serious or pleasant person, and he should in every way be made to feel his subject's disappointment. The good ruler, like the good artist, can be recognized at once by the inflexible discomfort of his life, isolation, further, being essential. Here, then, we can formulate a valuable rule for the conduct of the ruled, as follows, the ruler should be made to pay for ruling in every possible way. He should be prevented at all cost from sharing in the pastimes or simple advantages of his inferiors. Rule. So be it. You should say to him, in your acts, if not in your words. Rule away, Dick Whittington, thrice Lord Mayor, Lord Chancellor, Lord King, or anything else you please, of any town you like. But if we are of different clay, then understand, Lord, that we are of different clay. We are foolish little people with whom you must not mix, shaming us with the superior quality of your superior clay. We will be your creatures, we will depend on you. But we will not live with you. Our respect prevents us from associating with you in any way. There must be no dropping into the nursery for a romp, into the kitchen for a cuddle, or into the garden for a nice pat a ball about a net. No, no, my lord. Keep my distance, you keep your distance. Go back to Jehovah on the mountain, and hobnob with your kind. We know our place. We are your servants. Recollect what is owing to your position. This system of reprisal for the odious fact of rule or, if you like, it can be regarded as a discipline to keep the ruler up to the mark, just as wealthy people are so often heard observing, in generalizing about artists and men of science, that they should be kept poor, as this forces them to work, should be extended to every form of superiority or excellence, political, social, or intellectual. No form of person extensively imposing his will, for their good, on others, should escape. But, of course, of all things this least of all requires formulation. For people do not require any lessons in this aspect of the art of being ruled. But where our political rulers are concerned today, in Western democracies, this system of keeping your distance is very little observed. One open privilege and evident power returns this can be remedied. At present that, like so many other things, is impossible. So the most valuable privilege and weapon of an inferior is for the time obsolete. For the sake of the ruled, that is my argument the ruler should be forced to rule by force, ostensibly, responsibly, as does, to the great disgust of our Western liberals, the Soviet or fascist government. That all your troubles come from that charming neighbor of yours, whose bald head you see peaceably shining in the early morning Sunday sun while he waters his lawn, who is always ready with a cheery word on the weather, the holidays, the cricket score that is what is intolerable. Riding past your modest dwelling in shining armor, at the head of a brilliant cavalcade, scowling at your nameplate on the gate, 
or kissing his hand to your wife as she peeps apprehensively from behind the respectfully drawn curtains, Mr. Lionel Brown, your altogether too anonymous neighbor, would be better that way. You would know which way to take him then, would you not? But we need not invoke this Timor-like figure of Asiatic despotism, as he, at all events, will not arrive for some time, if ever. The harsh and ominous words, ruler and ruled, although they must be used, are in practice infinitely tempered to the shorn lamb in our educationalist era. Education plays, and will continue to play, a much more important part in government than physical and exterior force. Force is a passing and precarious thing, whereas to get inside a person's mind and change his very personality is the effective way of reducing him and making him yours. Merely to chain him up like a dog or a slave is the act of an unimaginative tyrant. To kill him is equally meaningless. It is by taking him when he is young, and educating him, that you can secure him to yourself. The physical part of power, like the bloody part of revolution, should not be insisted on. The causes that made this great revolution or readjustment of power possible, namely science, must also continue to influence the form that power takes. Without the recent spectacular advance of science no unity would have been possible, and small competition would have continued as the basis of social organization. The tremendous power science confers on men in their war not only with nature, but with other men, has made unity certain. But what distinguishes the new revolutionary ruler from the commercial magnate of our own democratic society is that the former is not, first of all, a money man, but an open political leader. His aims, however practical, are not entirely circumscribed by economy. The best and most ancient material of speculative thought has gone to the making of his economic picture. What was it that made the brilliant groups of revolutionary aristocrats of the last century in Russia, England, and elsewhere, revolutionary? Why did the Byrons, Shelleys, and Swinburns in England, Tolstoys, Bakunins, etc., in Russia, become so unpatriotic and lawless all of a sudden in the cause of universal upheaval? Because revolution was on the side of philosophic thought, and also Christian thought, of course, which they had been taught as little boys. Without that they would hardly have turned with so much gusto against the society in which they occupied such an enviable position. The state of mind of the social revolutionary is the permanent state of mind of most philosophers. There are few revolutionary parties that have this permanent ideal as a dogma. The Bolshevik party had apparently this doctrine from the start, and it is said that Lenin was confronted with it by his old associates at the time of his realistic conversion. But there cannot have been many revolutionaries, ever, who possess such a radical program. All the means the revolutionist takes to reach some sort of perfection or emancipated life is only a violent mass or group expression of what the philosopher, without urging, and in the detachment of his contemplation, desires for men. Socrates did not formulate a doctrine of propaganda by deed, but he was as revolutionary as Bakunin, indeed, more so, because his mind was so much more powerful. But the permanent state of mind of the revolutionary ruler will now be that of the philosopher, a more cultivated, in addition to a more able, ruling class than Europe has ever possessed as promised. Chapter 8. The European's Physical Liberty. Before leaving the region of general principles it will be useful to examine one of the characteristic tenets of liberty as conceived of in the European world, namely, physical liberty. This subject can be introduced by following a few remarks of Gouda in his conversations with Eckermann. He is discussing the libertarian peculiarities of his brother poet. All the work of Schiller, Buddha said, is dominated by the idea of liberty, in his youth, it was physical liberty that preoccupied him, later, it was the liberty of the mind. What a singular thing is physical liberty. According to my idea, anybody easily has enough of it. For instance, you see this room here, and the one next to it, the door of which is open, and in which is my bed. It isn't big, and the space is further diminished by all sorts of furniture, books, manuscripts, objet d'art. It is big enough for me, however, have lived in it all the winter, and I have hardly put my foot in the front rooms. What is the use to me, then, of any huge house, and the liberty to go from one room to the other, if this liberty is of no use to me? When you have liberty enough to live safe and sound and apply yourself to your business, you have all the liberty you want. Besides, we are all of us only free on certain conditions, which must be fulfilled. If Schiller was in his youth so obsessed with physical liberty, that is partly due to the nature of his mind, and more still to the restraint imposed on him by military discipline at the military academy. But in his maturity, when he possessed as much physical liberty as he wanted, he then wished for the liberty of the mind, and it could almost be said that it was that idea that killed him. These very interesting remarks of Gouda, himself a particularly revolutionary figure, apply with great force to the circumstances of our life today, 
for the question of physical liberty is a much more burning one than it was in his day, and no effort is made to answer it or understand it. The questions of travel and domicile grow more and more urgent as the human mass grows. Today there is complete liberty of circulation everywhere for everybody. People without anything in particular to do avail themselves of this carte blanche. In great herds they move painfully to the seaside. Both their progress there and back, and the short time they spend on the pebbles or sand, where it is rather a sea of people than a sea of water that they behold, is so exhausting that it is the power of the holiday idea alone that can sustain them. Another idea, or word, could be quite easily substituted for this. In a more continuous way this carte blanche to circulate is used and abused by great masses of women daily in the cities. A never-ending stream of luxurious omnibuses transports them for a few pence wherever they want to go. The unequal distribution of these masses causes the same sort of disequilibrium as will the constant agitation of masses of liquid in a vessel jerk this way and that. There is no danger of the vessel upsetting, but dense congeries of beings accumulate wherever there are shops, and masses of huge vehicles cart them up and down. All this movement, and the great staffs of men employed in the various operations connected with it, in the factories turning out the conveyances, at the garages, and on the road, is largely pointless. For the frocks, underclothing, boots and shoes required, great suburban outfitters would answer the purpose. If the bus ticket could not be obtained without a travel permit, the immense waste of labor, shattering of the roads, and stagnation of masses of traffic accompanying this ritual of shopping, would be spared. And this would, after the first fortnight of indignation, satisfy the shopper just as well. The woman whose practice it is to engage daily in this tussle in the great shopping centers would find this restriction on her physical liberty a blessed relief. Her health would improve, doctor's bills be spared, and homework benefit. For the family, so stoutly defended by liberal sentiment, hardly exists for these mechanically restless, half-useless individuals, living in a no-man's land halfway between the extravagances of chivalry and a new economic era. The same observations apply to the massing of people in the great cities for work. The competitive system makes this insane clustering at a center of exchange, and the lengthening of the lines of communication to distant suburbs, necessary. It is a great hardship for the workers, and a huge and wasteful transport system results from this barbarous lack of system and shyness where the obvious remedy of trustification and unity is concerned. People prefer to organize the necessary machinery to make this vast discomfort and waste possible, for the sake of a word. As to foreign travel, the tourist is obviously the greatest absurdity. The masses of people who cross the 3,000 miles of the Atlantic every year to do, what? to gape at the place where a very uninteresting blaggard divorced his sixth wife 300 years ago, or perspired at his favorite game of tennis, until he became too fat, when his courtiers also had to stop playing, when in their own country there must be, alive and quite ready to be looked at, men who have divorced more women than Henry VIII ever dreamt it was possible to do, and perspire as much. As to the quantities of tourists who yearly cross the channel into England or France, attracted by a cheap holiday, Were that holiday not attractively cheap and easy they would not miss the week or two spent in gazing at people who are in every respect very like themselves, and more so every day, only that they say we instead of yes, which is peculiar, but must pall in the long run. Guidebook in hand, they examine some quite commonplace building where some event of no more intrinsic interest than a football match, or, at the most, a bungalow murder, happened. They are not stirred in any way, how could they be, as they have not the least idea what the event in question signified historically in any case, and the building is usually so dull that it can never have caused any emotion since it was built? Therefore they have gained nothing in experience, only displaced themselves for nothing, to the great inconvenience of everybody, except an occasional hotel keeper. All this energy, such as it is, that has to be worked off in physical displacement could be directed into more interesting channels. They say the imaginative quality so noticeable in the Russian peasant is due to the fact that for the winter months he has spent a great part of his time, owing to the severity of the weather, lying on top of his stove. Willy-nilly, he was forced to reflect a little bit about things in general. The conditions in his case were needlessly severe and forbidding. A scholar or a student of history or architecture, or a trained painter, or a parson is interested in cathedrals, for instance, nobody else is, and when he looks at them he feels overcome with boredom, self-reproach, hatred, sleepiness, fatigue, thirst, and absent-mindedness. But with many people with a specialist claim on their interests some of these symptoms occur, either because their technical specialization has imperfectly overcome the old slothful, unimaginative atom, symbolized by the deep chasm of their yawning mouths, or else because the cathedral is really in no way remarkable. Or let us take the language attraction. That, again, is really only a matter for students of language. 
the little sensation caused at first by seeing a lot of foreigners talking together a jargon close to you, in the very home and fastness of these foreigners, is not one that it would be a very serious thing to be deprived of. These differences are primitive things, that in future will be of interest to the curious student while they last. But they are, as it were, a sign of backwardness. They no longer represent either a living culture or political power. The nations of Europe are helplessly laid out side by side, each talking its own language like so many Indian tribes in reservations or reductions. It is even rather indecent, today, to take an interest in them, or intrude on their decadence and distress. Some scientific motive, such as takes a man to the quarters of the Plains Indians or the Lelots, is respectable. But the tripper should not be encouraged. The French, those perfect traditional hosts, will soon hardly possess the necessary machinery to entertain on such a scale, at all hours, and in all places. All the European nations have recently suffered great losses, and their privacy should be respected. If they retain their local customs and speech, it will be on sufferance and as a concession to a colony. This sad condition should no longer be exploited, especially there should be more reserve on the part of the different tribes concerned. Visitors are not wanted. So this matter can be left in this way, our primitive characteristics, our wee-wees and jodges, should no longer be made a peep show of. For a serious student that is another matter. But idle curiosity where these peculiarities are concerned, these afflictions, really, as they are today, cannot be justified. That in the old days the cosmopolitan aristocrat naturally traveled about, we know. But we are not, most of us, cosmopolitan aristocrats, and most of us do not know the elements even of any speech except our own. These cosmopolitan aristocrats were at home everywhere, for there were other cosmopolitan aristocrats everywhere with whom they could consort. They were the good Europeans. But there are no Europeans today. But the real approach to the question of foreign travel and cheap tourism is that the mass of people do not want it. The remnants of the 19th century middle classes who have any money to spare enjoy this pastime. But the great majority of the English or French population, for instance, would not hesitate a moment between a free fortnight at one of their own seaside places and a fortnight abroad. The latter proposition fills them with uneasiness, dislike of what is strange, remote, unrestful, out of their routine. It is only the perpetual thrusting under their noses of advertisements recommending cheap foreign travel that ever induces some of them to take this disagreeable step. It is, in short, an excellent example of how the precious liberty of free movement is not a liberty at all. But so long as people have to get money by competitive enterprise and advertisement, so long will people be expensively dragged hither and thither, in motor coaches, trains, steamboats, and omnibuses, and have the idea imposed on them that they are enjoying this displacement. Most people are born mollusks, there is no offense in saying it, for it is quite true, and they are made into sham students, artists, cosmopolitan aristocrats, globetrotters, philosophers, poets, mountaineers, buccaneers, and gypsies.